So the goal of our State of the Science Conference was to help adult systems recognize the needs of the young adults in their systems, um, that they typically have poor career starts, there are few services and supports with evidence of efficacy to support, to, to help them achieve those goals, and that there aren't many developmentally appropriate and appealing services and supports, and that they need developmentally appropriate and appealing supports. And then our second goal was to obtain adult system perspectives on knowledge and needed uh, the knowledge needed for system change. Now we will use the term careers, and one of the things that happened in this conference is that we had a lot of chat about that term career because it can be laden with middle class or upper class values. Um, that we don't mean by career that you're headed off to be a doctor, lawyer, whatever it is. Really what we're talking about are occupations with some opportunities for growth that are undertaken for a significant period of time during a person's life. It can be skilled, unskilled, professional, but is that longitudinal walk, that ability to have work that is sustained over time, that helps you achieve what you want in life, that we're talking about as a career. And that career development is comprised of the learning and cognitive elements that influence those career choices, career activities, performances, and attainment in the career domain. And so there are a lot of things that go into building careers and our focus is on trying to strengthen those pieces that allow people to have sustained and meaningful employment over time. Young adults, I just want to clarify, we're talking about 18 to 30 year olds. We hear lots of different sort of time frames, but for us, for us this is what we're talking about today. And um, I also want to put this up to say that there are many adult systems, just as we have many child systems, and the two that primarily provide most of the services that young adults with serious mental health conditions can access are the adult mental health system and the vocational rehabilitation system. So we have focused on them a bit more. So our conference, um, the key stakeholders were federal program representatives of federal programs that really can have strong influence on adult systems. And you can see from this lengthy um, list Department of Labor, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the Rehabilitation Services Administration, the Department of Education, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and you can read the list. These are all federal programs that have strong influence on the way that adult systems can provide services. We also want to infuse the conversation with the voice of young adults with lived experience and with their family members' perspectives. We also had research programs and researchers there who focused on education, employment, careers, mental health, disabilities, or rehabilitation. Um, and many of those researchers were people who come from the adult side, who've done research for years, maybe in employment with adults. Um, and so we had them in attendance as well, and then state level administrators. What we did for the conference is that we conducted in-depth research literature reviews and a little bit of the sort of the gray literature, uh, white papers that might not have gone through peer review, book chapters, things like that. Um, we produced three lengthy reviews, one in education and training, one in working and employment, and one in systems and policy. Each paper included a young adult as an author, and each review included what we thought was a reasonable research agenda to move the field forward within that area. We also solicited a response paper. We didn't want to just take our perspectives, but we really wanted to get, and we knew that we couldn't do justice to the many perspectives on these very broad topics. So we um, obtained a group of, of reviewers and asked them to please provide their responses to what we had written. It was a panel of experts with a variety of perspectives that you can see here. And then we presented these reviews and responses to the attendees of the audience. We had for each topic a general discussion. Then we went out to the breakout groups for discussions in smaller groups. Um, there was an opportunity to review the research agenda for people to provide their thoughts about what, if we hadn't listed something they thought was important, they could throw that into the hopper and say, I think this is important. And then we actually had people vote on future research priorities. So what we're going to do today is to give you very quick synopses of those in-depth reviews that now include some of the feedback from the uh, responder papers as well. We're going to share with you what the research agendas were that people voted on, what, what pe this group primarily reflecting adult system stakeholders felt was important for the next lines of research in this area. 
Nancy Korolov is going to present systems and policy issues. I'm not going to give you everybody's really wonderful expertise background. It's in, it's in your um, program um, in service of time. Marsha Ellison is going to present on uh, education training. I'll present on employment and careers. Amanda Costa is going to present on uh, young adult perspectives. And Steve Reeder is going to present a state um, perspective. And so with no further ado, Nancy Korloff is going to talk with you about systems. Thank you. Okay, I want to start first of all by thanking the other people that worked on the paper that we wrote. And you can see it's the paper's about systems and policy, so we had to have a big group of people. We have lots of names there, several of them are here. But I just I want to acknowledge that there were a lot of people involved in preparing this material and in looking at all of the responses. So a little bit of what I want to do, if I can make this work is um, uh, talk kind of generally about systems and policy challenges, and particularly where do young people fit in the adult mental health system. And I have to say, when the first time Mary Ann said, no, we're not going to focus on how young people move from children to adult, but we're going to really focus on are the right services in the adult system, I thought, here she goes, tilting at wheel windmills again, you know. Why did she want to take this on? But, uh, and uh, so and to some extent, I've kind of come a long ways in terms of realizing how child-centric, child mental health system-centric, uh, my thinking had become. Now, I've only been in this research field for, what, 30 years, so maybe I have an excuse. But uh, it was a really fascinating journey. And I got to know some adult mental health people that I didn't know before. I found out that Steve Reeder doesn't bite, although he looks like he might. <laughs> um, but some of my best friends are now adult mental health people. Um, so here are the two main issues that uh, I want to throw out. And I think this is just for context. So the first one is the ones that we in the children's mental health system tend to focus on the most. And that's what are the challenges of moving from child mental health system to adult mental health system. So how do we help the 16, the 17, the 18 year old young person get into the service system uh, as adults and get the appropriate services that they need? And to be honest, for a long time I thought that was the issue. You know, if we can just get them into the adult mental health system, if they need it, they don't all need it, um, things will be fine. It was basically that the adult mental health system wasn't letting them in. The second question is the question we really ended up focusing on, and it's what I'm going to talk about most to, uh, today. Um, are young people able to get effective, age-appropriate services once they get to the adult mental health system? And if not, what are some of the barriers? So, so I'll start very briefly with this, just to give you some context. In general, uh, the, the incidence and prevalence is not that different than what we know about children who need mental health services. At least two studies have found that at least somewhere between six and seven percent of young adults uh, have a serious mental health channel. So we're not dealing with a lot more or a lot less. It's, it's a pretty even progression here. So are young adults underrepresented in the adult system? This is the, a question that I hope many states have put some attention to. I haven't seen a lot of data on this. We have uh, one state, this is Massachusetts, who's done the study that they showed that about 21% of the general adult population in the state uh, was 18 to 25, but only about 6.7% uh, of the mental health population was age 18 to 25. And I bring this one up, uh, I th I'm hoping that uh, Steve may have time to talk about a similar kind of data from his state, but this is the kind of data that every state really has available. Uh, there's, I don't know of a state where you couldn't sit down and probably get this comparison and have this as a benchmark uh, pretty easily. So this is the next question that really kind of threw me at our state of the science. And, and in the comments, we got back to our paper. And, and I've stated it here as, are young adults unique? Are, is there really anything about young adults that means that their mental health services or other services need to be any different than anybody else in the adult population? 
if we're person-centered and we're uh, going where the client's at and all those things, is there really anything that's unique? And what I've thrown up here or listed here are a few of the things I've heard other people say about, well, this is why young adults are different. But I'll tell you, I think this is one of the first kind of pieces in the, the theory and getting to a theory of change that uh, we need to pay a lot of attention to. I don't think at this point we have a very good articulation, either from the children's side or from the adult side, about why the services for young adults need to be age appropriate or developmentally appropriate, and what does that actually mean? What does that look like? And um, you can see some of the examples here. Uh, I'm sure there are other arguments that could be made. It, it's a dialogue we haven't had enough of and we need to have before we go too much further. Because I'll tell you, from, from many people in the adult mental health system, perceive young adults to be pretty much the same as all the rest of their clients. And therefore, it, they should partake of and use the services that are there for everyone. And they, it's, they don't buy our argument or my argument about why young adults are different. So it's one of the, I think, one of the questions we have to do some grappling with. So now here's the question of uh, what is available? Are there age-appropriate services available in the adult mental health services? And you'll notice how old this data is. Uh, it's, uh, if there's another study out there, somebody please come and tell me about it, because this is probably a study that uh, badly needs to be redone. Um, but at, as of 2006, you can see that 49% of the states offered at least one developmentally appropriate service, which may mean one case manager in one agency. It didn't, certainly didn't mean everybody across the state were receiving it. 10% had age tailor vocational support, and nobody was offering age tailor educational support. Now we know that it's changed since then because we know about some educational support and some, but we don't know how much it's changed. Here are some ideas that came out of the state of the science. Uh, and I, probably the first research question there, does offering age appropriate educational and career development support increase sustained access to services for young adults? And this got a lot of votes, so to speak, from the participants at the State of the Science Conference. This was a very high priority. Because the, the, the question, because we know that often young adults don't engage easily or quickly uh, in services, particularly in mental health services, the question is if there were age appropriate services, would they get in and stay in services for longer? And the assumption then the next step would be, and then are the outcomes better? And then the next step after that is, does it reduce service needs later on? Um, this was lots of interest in this particular question. Um, so what are the barriers to apply to providing age appropriate services? Again, uh, I apologize for the very old study, but thank you, Marianne, for having done it, <laughs> ever. Um, what, this is what adult mental health system, state level people said was why they didn't provide developmentally appropriate services. There isn't enough money to do anything special for this small group, okay, 21%, this small group. Uh, there isn't any specific funding available for this group. And these are, this is very interesting. There's no, the lack of leadership, the issue isn't a priority. And finally, there isn't any group. There's no advocacy group clamoring for change. Um, so it only reinforces what we all know, which is when you're at the state level in mental health, there's an awful lot of pressure, and it's how much pressure is on you is what you pay attention to sometimes and where the money is. But I think this, this, uh, this is really maybe pointing more towards a possible intervention, which is making sure that we have identified leadership that are focused and interested and knowledgeable about young adults, and also thinking more, again, about the um, advocacy groups and what role they might play, and I think there's a little more about that in a minute. And I'm going to run it here. So that was old data. We had the opportunity last, uh, in 2013, in the spring, to talk to a group of uh, adult mental health, mostly state-level adult mental health people uh, from the HTI sites. And so we asked them the same question. And you know, it was a kind of a very informal uh, focus group, discussion group. And this was the kind of things that they said. And it's, it's interesting how similar it is to 2005. Difficult to find vocational funds for vocational support. 
there aren't any vocational supports for anybody, let alone for this age. So all adults have trouble finding vocational supports. Um, a, age group isn't a priority, hasn't gotten any attraction. This is the lack of leadership. Adult consumer groups don't advocate for issues important to young adults. And uh, general mental health services are available to all adults. This is the argument that what's available to everybody is uh, it's enough, is fine, is appropriate, should be good enough for young adults. Why do they need anything special? Am I running out of time? Okay. So here's some of the research questions that got discussed and got voted for in the uh, state of the science. What are the barriers and facilitators? I think we have to go back to that question of what are the barriers and facilitators besides money. I know we all know that money is one piece. But what makes it so difficult or what makes it difficult for uh, programming to happen that is specific to young adults? What's it going to take to overcome those barriers? Um, and this last one is one that we've actually, there's been some increased interest in in the last few years. If you increase the contact and the collaboration between child and adult mental health, does that help? And we've been, uh, you know, we've had the HTI grants and the PYT grants, all, all of which, these are the healthy transition grants, have had as part of their, um, their focus, part of what they're doing is to try to bring adult and child mental health closer together. And we're beginning to get a little data about whether or not, in fact, that is a, a, uh, an intervention that in, that's going to make a difference. And we're going to have a session later today in which we'll talk about some of that data. But the question of, is that what the, and in most cases it's been the federal government through their contracting process, is that where they should be putting their effort? Will that cause the outcomes in the system that we want to see for young adults? And maybe it's one piece. And finally, here are some overarching systems and policy issues that keep getting brought up. Um, and this, the first one is not just for young adults with psychiatric disabilities. The question about being able to receive SSI or SSDI, whether or not that's a hindrance, whether that encourages career development um, is a very important question for our young adults as well. Um, now that we have a different or are beginning to have a different health care system, what difference is it going to make that young adults can get um, health benefits, mental health benefits um, and physical health benefits? Uh, we still have the question of what does the role of eligibility criteria play? And we know from some research that there, there is quite a bit of difference between, in some states, between what it takes to receive services in the adult system and what it takes to get re services in the uh, child system. And then the final one, as I get the sign to stop, and I'm hoping Amanda will maybe speak a little more to this, and, but it was a question that people were very interested in, in is what is the role of young adults uh, and their families or young adult allies in planning and evaluating services and what difference does it make? The whole question of do we get a different service system? Do we get a better, more effective, uh, more acceptable service system if we're very conscious and intentional about including young adults in the planning, the designing, and the evaluating of those systems? And now I'm going to turn it over to Marcia. So hi, everybody. Um, my, my charge at the State of the Science Conference was to uh, present uh, on the education domain. Um, and that's what I will do here. Um, this whole talk is available in our proceedings, so I'm giving you another advertisement for uh, please download it and you'll see everything in there. OK. Uh, just uh, to uh, note also that this um, paper that I'm presenting was co-authored by myself and Amanda Costa, who is here, and also um, Sally Rogers from the Boston University Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation. I'm getting quite an echo here, so I'm, uh, <laughs> pardon me if I'm a little lagging. Okay. I'm going to describe the uh, scope of the challenge, uh, school-based supports and interventions. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on supported education um, and then discuss uh, how our conference uh, described the lessons learned and next steps for research. Scope of the challenge. Um, so um, it's very straightforward that higher education leads to better income and careers. We know that from Department of Labor data, it's very consistent. Um, it's not only true for people with no disabilities, but it's also 
been shown uh, clearly for people with psychiatric disabilities as well. However, we do know that psychiatric disabilities uh, does impact educational performance and attainment. Some of the ways that we know that there are data that show that 50% of students with a mental disorder will drop out of high school. Um, we also know that special education serves only a, a small pro smaller proportion of all um, students, uh, adolescents uh, with uh, serious mental health conditions. Um, and among those smaller proportion that are in special education, only 11% of, of those students with psych disabilities will go on to a four-year college. Um, that's uh, uh, in compa comparison to 40% of the regular population who will go on to a four-year college. What about college? Um, so even though there's a small proportion that are going on to college, nonetheless, um, there are quite a lot of um, uh, studies and reports um, that there are increasing numbers of students with psychiatric disabilities at college. Um, and colleges are beginning to recognize that and understand that they uh, need to respond. So we see that 9 to 18 percent of all college students have mild to significant mental health issues. Um, there are more and more students who are seeking help from college um, mental health counseling centers. And more importantly, there are larger and larger percentages of students who are reporting uh, suicidal ideation. Um, and suicide attempts on colleges and um, the, uh, among college students with psychiatric disabilities, we find the highest rate of uh, suicide completion. For those students that um, are able to go on to a four-year college, they, we, tend, we see that they have a delayed enrollment after high school. They tend to enroll as part-time students and there are high dropout rates again in college as there are in high school. Um, we are aware that students with psych disabilities on campuses uh, have an unwillingness and report an unwillingness to seek help at college. 21% um, of them do not report their disability at all, and that's the highest rate of any disability group at colleges. Uh, among students, there are perceptions that student disability services offices don't know how to help. There is a fear of being stigmatized, and they also um, report that they expect to find uncooperative responses to their requests for accommodations at student disability offices. So what can we, uh, what has been done for both high school and colleges to help um, students with psych disabilities? Um, everyone here knows the uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which specifies transition planning. Um, and you're going to see on these slides some more advertisements um, for the uh, tip sheets that we have created at the Transitions RTC. Um, there is a fair amount of knowledge about supports and uh, interventions that are available for students. Uh, we're trying to make that in information available to everybody. So on um, uh, this tip sheet is for um, teens on IEPs, so students with psych disabilities in high schools. Uh, can receive special education services, and more importantly, they can receive transition services um, to help them plan for their next steps after s school completion in either uh, continued education or employment. Um, the new research by um, uh, Mary Wagner that's been published in uh, last year in this Psychiatric Rehabilitation Journal from the National Transition Longitudinal Study Two, I think I got the acronym right there, um, shows that, that among special education students with psych disabilities, there's been an increase in high school completion from 47% to 78%, uh, which is uh, remarkable and uh, you know, very encouraging. We don't know if that's really because of uh, transition planning or special education services, for sure, but nonetheless, uh, that is an encouraging um, uh, improvement. Um, another support that's available to high school students and to um, uh, adults and young adults with mental health conditions are st the state agencies of vocational rehabilitation. So we are profiling VR agencies because, as Marianne said, we are trying to talk about what the adult system has to offer 
um, and state agencies of vocational rehabilitation is one of those. Um, they, um, youth account for 16 to 24 percent of uh, all VR clients, um, and VR, importantly, can provide uh, supports for education. They will, they will actually pay for education if it's in the service of a vocational goal. Most importantly, uh, VR is making many, many states are really making attempts to try to reach down to um, the high schools and to be a part of the transition teams and to do, and to do transition planning. I would say that the, the, the problem with vocational rehabilitation is that they are mostly identifying those students with um, intellectual disabilities and um, psych disabilities are still somewhere lurking in the background, um, but nonetheless it's an opportunity. Co so what about on colleges? Uh, what kind of supports do we have? Um, so the picture at colleges can be quite dismal. Um, what I have here on this slide um, is, um, is a slide from the um, uh, uh, campus advocacy to raise awareness about suicide um, and also the uh, Jed Foundation, which is also working to increase suicide awareness on campus. Um, there are attempts to try to take an environmental approach to campuses that if we treat mental health um, in a collaborative way, in a systems way, uh, rather than an individual, this individual needs um, you know, help, but rather to try to promote mental wellness on campuses, that that may prove to be a, a, vi a real viable support for students um, on campuses. Um, in particular, there is a call for changes in policies. Uh, right now, the campus policies can be truly punitive to students with psych disabilities um, around occasions of uh, self-harm or um, suicide attempts. Uh, there is a recent uh, publication in Newsweek magazine in February, um, Colleges Flunk Mental Health. It's a really, truly damning picture of how uh, policies on, camp on campuses can um, uh, really hurt students with mental health conditions uh, by forcing them to leave, um, not refunding money, um, putting um, impossible criteria for students to be able to return to school. So these are some um, uh, suggestions, and there are many suggestions about how campus policies can be improved. Of course, we have educational accommodations. Uh, students on campuses are entitled to them just as, as uh, workers are entitled to uh, employment accommodations. However, students report to us that they are unaware of their rights or they fear disclosing. Um, and, they, uh, and they also, as I said, they expect that disability staff don't know how to accommodate psych disabilities. Um, students with psych disabilities are entitled to accommodations. There are many that can be very helpful, like extended test taking, um, 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 you know, isolated uh, um, uh, environments for taking tests and so forth. Um, and this tip sheet down here, it's all in the back in our exhibit table. Please pick them up. Describe some of these accommodations um, that Amanda uh, wrote and uh, has been a very popular tip sheet for us. Um, so please, if you are working with students, help them access their educational accommodations. Other supports are campus mental health counseling, peer support, and many suicide prevention activities. Uh, I'm going to fly through the supported education uh, slides. Uh, I, uh, supported education is an adult system service um, that is meant to enable a person to choose an educational goal and pursue activities to achieve that goal. Um, and if you're talking to adult system providers and you want to talk about educational supports, they'll say supported education. We. Um, these are some of the key components of supported education. And the values of supported education will look like the values um, and in any of our transition planning, choice and self-determination, provision of supports as needed, and of course, integrated educational settings. However, supported education has been tested mostly with adults who have serious mental illness. It's typically been offered through adult mental health agencies. Um, and we expect that there needs to be adaptation if supported education is going to be relevant to young adults. Uh, there's been a recent systematic review of supported education 
uh, by Sally Rogers. I will refer you to um, um, her uh, in-depth work on that. Um, but um, I will say that the, to sum that up, that there is no evidence from a randomized trial or well-controlled quasi-experimental trial that participation in a supported education intervention results in significantly greater educational engagement or enrollment. So that's, uh, that's the bad news. Um, the, um, but the good news is, is that they're really, the, the outcomes, trying to measure the outcomes for supported education is difficult. It takes a long time. And um, there really is um, an opportunity to do rigorous research. It just hasn't been done yet. We do have suggestive evidence that there are improvements in employment and in educational status as a result of participation in a supported education intervention, especially things like for self-esteem and quality of life. Okay. Um, I will just conclude by saying that there is promise on the horizon. There are new studies that are um, testing supported education and supported employment for young adults. Um, and these are some of the studies that are going on presently. We hope to get good news and to bring that to the conference in the future about supported education. Okay, uh, feel free to take a look at these. Uh, these are the references and I will turn it back to Marianne to talk about employment. We were a little worried you wouldn't be able to see Marcia when she came up here. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to adjust the mic back up. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we um, found in the research literature about employment and career supports. Uh, the co-authors on our uh, in-depth review were um, Jonathan Delman, who works at the Research and Training Center with us, and Tanya Dupree, who also works at the Research and Training Center with us. Now, as I alluded to earlier, career development is more than just getting a job. It's hard to have a career without having a job, but having a job doesn't give you a career. Uh, having multiple jobs over time uh, certainly contributes to that. But the field of vocational psychology has looked at a lot of uh, elements that contribute to the building of a career over time. These uh, kinds of elements are, are career self-efficacy beliefs, career goals, uh, vocational identity, um, skill development, both soft skills, uh, people skills, as well as the skills for doing the actual job, um, career outcome expectations. There's some examples of some of the uh, sort more um, cognitive elements of, of building a career. Now, we were saying earlier that one of the issues that we hear often from people um, who are more familiar with adults is that they're not really convinced that the needs of young adults are that different from the needs of mature adults uh, to the extent that they might need to modify services. And so we were looking in the literature for examples of um, research that would highlight what we certainly hear from young adults, and I think in many ways our expert opinion is that young adults are really different from more mature adults in, in many ways, and that subgroups of young adults are different from other subgroups of young adults. Um, but there, there's a variety of research out there that suggests that this is a really critical foundational period for career development. Um, by the mid-20s, there are significant career differences between those who, pers who pursue colleges, college degrees and those who don't, and those who start families and those who don't, and this is in the general population. So some of those critical choices right after high school, whether one pursues college or not, whether one pursues a family or not, by the mid-20s, it has a very clear impact on one's career. By their mid-20s, most young adults, again, in the general population, are long-term or career-consistent jobs. Um, there are important cognitive aspects of career development that actually crystallize during young adulthood, and it can make it difficult to change some things like vocational ide identity um, as we move into later stages of life, later stages being like your 30s. Um, insufficient career activities uh, can interfere with adult career roles, and career efforts during young adulthood predict later career success. So we think that this variety of research in the general population is a strong suggestion that this is a really foundational period in many people's lives for launching 
the, their, their life's work, whether that be, uh, as we've said earlier, skilled or unskilled, professional, non-professional, what you do is strongly shaped by your experience in your 20s. So we wanted to then look to see, do we have strong evidence that young adults with psychiatric disabilities actually struggle with employment or careers um, at this point in their lives? And what was really shocking, as we really scoured the literature, was we were really, it was really hard pressed, we were hard pressed to find data about young adults who are accessing adult services, not young adults who have aged out of being a child who has had a serious mental health condition as an adolescent, but people that we could say to adult systems, look, these are the young people you are serving and here's how they are struggling. We found no studies that we could leverage that way to say, this is what, what um, you're seeing in the population that you are serving. What we did find was a little bit of research around young adults with anxiety and depression that showed that they were less employed than mature adults with anxiety and depression. Um, and that we have a variety of research following the young people that we, in this audience, probably care about the most, young people who are struggling with serious mental health conditions during adolescence. As we follow them into young adulthood, we know that they struggle with employment um, and success. Uh, but it's a, cre key, a key research um, point that's missing to be able to demonstrate to uh, adult stakeholders, adult system stakeholders, that the young adults that they serve are actually struggling. Okay. So I'm going to give you a slide that gives you the summary of the state of the science on employment for young adults with psychiatric disabilities. Single slide. If you need to do anything else after this for a little while, you can go ahead and do it because this really sums it up. There's no research that has examined the career development process in young adults with psychiatric disabilities. By career development, again, not just do they have a job or not and what's the quality of that job, but something about some of those cognitive elements. Have they de developed a vocational identity? What are their career goals like? How does that relate to their, their activities to develop their career capacities? There's no research that identifies the malleable factors, and by malleable factors, factors that can change, that we can target our interventions and supports at, that are unique to these young adults' development of a strong career. Um, we don't have any research about that relative to young adults compared to mature adults or to young adults with other disabilities. And research on interventions to support the career development in this population is truly in its infancy. This is the state of the science. So I'm going to give you a little detail. We looked at the research literature on a variety of services that are generally available in vocational rehabilitation services or through men adult mental health services around which there is some research. So these are general vocational rehabilitation services. There is a specific approach, very broad guidelines called Guideposts for Success that was developed for transition age youth with disabilities um, that has been the focus of a Social Security Administration um, pilot study. Um, there are clubhouses. Uh, Colleen McKay presented uh, just before this plenary about um, clubhouse work to try to engage young adults more um, and more effectively um, in the work that, that they do. Uh, there is supported employment that's focused on the, for psychiatric disabilities, the individualized placement and support model, the IPS model. And then there are a whole host of career development activities that you primarily see offered by like career counselors um, and um, you can actually pay people to help you coach your career. There's a whole field of, of actually some research there that we looked at all of this. Um, so what we know is that the impact of any of these interventions on careers, again, just not on employment, hasn't been examined. What we tend to see is a study that says um, we may have randomized to this, con this condition or that condition, and we looked at their um, rate of employment, how many of them got a job at any point in the following 12 months, uh, about how many weeks did they work out of that 12-month period, and what was their rate of pay. But that doesn't really tell us about people developing careers, and it doesn't give us information about what's going to happen five years down the line. Has it really helped them to have a long-term trajectory of meaningful employment and career? Out of all of the interventions that we look at, the IPS model really does have the strongest research findings. They consistently find, compared to anything else that they are compared with, that the employment outcomes for adults um, are stronger. Employment, again, being how many weeks were they, were they employed on average, how many hours was there, and what was the um, average pay. Now, these are primarily studies in adults. The average age is typically around 38, 39 years old. They recently did an analysis of young adults in randomized clinical trials that, of IPS, 
And there is, from a very small sample, some encouraging evidence that young adults who basically say, I want to work, I want to work now, if they're randomized to IPS or usual services, actually do better in IPS. But again, the, the majority of the weeks in the 12, the 18 month period that they followed them, young people were not employed. And none of these in interventions have truly achieved more than low wage, mostly part time work. So that, those are the limitations of vocational services for adults with serious mental health conditions or psychiatric disabilities. Now the IPS model, because it is, by our standards of evidence-based practice, it is a well-established evidence-based practice. And so adaptations tend to be attracted to, to what's already in the evidence base. Um, so for a really interesting and important group of young adults, those who are in the early episodes of, of psychosis, schizophrenia, they have developed two versions of IPS for that population to try to support their continuation on their careers. Um, one in Australia that combined supported employment with supported education, so that supported employment specialist now also addressed supports for education. And another one in Los Angeles where they did the um, supported employment, supported education, they actually also added a curriculum on working, they added some supports around substance use information in, in the workplace to try to reduce it, um, and some family education. We at the Transitions RTC have also tried to adapt IPS specifically for uh, very young adults with very um, intensive adolescent mental health service uses they transition into adulthood, most of whom have been involved with the child welfare system. Um, we did the combined support employment, support education model, and we added peer mentors. And so IPS is something that we can build off of, but we still don't know. We're at the early stages of taking a look to see what the impact of these approaches are. Um, there's less research specifically in young adults from any of the other models that I mentioned. The guideposts for success, this was specifically a, a study of transition age youth with disabilities. There was random assignment. There's no fidelity measure. It's very broad guidelines. There were better outcomes for those in that guidepost than in usual services, but broadly for youth with disabilities. There was one site that specifically worked with youth with SED, um, and there was no significant difference between the two. Um, and we're not quite sure why that is. Um, so we're not quite sure what that means for, uh, for this population. There have been no clinical trials research focused on young adults in VR services or in clubhouses to date. Um, there's some evidence that outcomes in young adults are better than mature adults when they've done some age comparisons, just at, usually um, reporting on demographics, our outcomes in the younger population look like X, it usually isn't the focus of the study. But we don't have any detail as to why or why not they might be doing better or worse. So I think the promise of where we're going is the new models that are under development. There are a variety. Joanne Malloy presented here earlier um, in this conference about the Renew model that she's uh, moving ahead with some research development. Career Visions is being developed by our partners at the Pathways uh, RTC um, with, uh, when they've done a small clinical trial with some positive results. Um, there is an interesting social enterprise intervention for homeless young adults, many of whom have a mental health condition. Um, as I mentioned, we are um, developing the IPS uh, intervention that has peer mentors attached to it. Um, and we've been developing an adaptation of multi-systemic therapy for young adults who have serious mental health conditions and recent justice system involvement in, the, in which part of that we've explored how to provide better vocational supports. Now the shared features of all of these interventions that have tried to focus more on young adults is an emphasis on career exploration and assessment and planning, um, a support of concurrent employment and education or training because young people are often doing, they might be doing both at the same time or they're needing to go back and forth between the two. Um, supporting young adults in leading or improving their capacity, leading and improving their capacities for career planning and implementation to give them the tools, as we you know, often say, the tools to fish, not giving them a fish dinner, trying to use this as a way to, to give them some tools for their future use when they don't need us anymore. Um, and to include family members as potential supports um, in, in a, you know, a very thoughtful way, in ways that uh, families can be supportive to young adults in um, a unique way. And just very quickly, what we heard back from the adult stakeholders was they felt that the most, I have to say, I felt like this uh, indicated to us that we had successfully got some buy-in that perhaps young adults in their systems needed developmentally appropriate services because the, the most endorsed research agenda 
that they put forth to us was to continue research with developing these models to test, these new models to test their career development efficacy. The other areas that they thought were important was to look at IPS research to identify subgroups um, that experience better or worse outcomes so that we can modify IPS better to do longitudinal research about young adult careers so that we can understand the quality of employment capacities over time so we know what we're trying to support people to do and what, what their um, outcomes can be to identify similarities and differences between young adults with psychiatric disabilities and young adults with other disabilities. So as we learn from maybe disability research, how much can that apply to young adults with psychiatric disabilities? And lastly, research to illuminate the specific mechanisms of IPS, IPS that produce better employment outcomes in young adults that might help us, again, think about things that we might emphasize or do differently. Um, and so that is a summary very quickly of the state of the art and or the state of the science the state of the art, right? <laughs> um, and where the adult systems thought we should be going to for future research. And Amanda Costa is going to talk to us about the young adult perspectives. How's everyone doing? Um, so I'm Amanda, like Marianne said, and I'm going to be talking about the young adult perspective. And I'm really excited to be here and be given the opportunity to bring the young adult voice to the table because we all know here how critical it is to do so. But I must say I'm also really excited because I went from on Sunday flying here from Massachusetts, which is where we're located, to discussing how much more snow we could get before we were forced to park in the street, to coming here and discussing with you fine folks this foreign concept that I forgot existed called the sunburn that people are getting in this awesome weather. So it's been really nice to be in sunny Florida and taking everything in. Um, so like I said, my job here is just discuss the youth voice perspective that we brought to the table at the State of Science Conference. At the conference, we tried to infuse youth voice in a different, few different ways because we realized how important it was to do so. Um, one of the ways was just kind of assessing the state of the science and the research that everyone here is talking about. We had emerging adult, or what we call young adult, co-authors on all three of the topic areas that you just heard from, um, employment, education, and pos policy. And we also had a emerging adult panel. So we had three different young adults, and you can see a picture of them with um, our moderator on the screen, share their perspective and personal experience with receiving systems and services in child and mental health systems, um, child and adult mental health systems, and also kind of just their struggles with education and employment and kind of what they've been through personally. And they were from the um, DC metro area. So they, they infused their youth voice through the panel and then we had these authors infusing their voice as what really needed to be done for research and what the state of science, where we were with that. Um, we also had myself and three other young adults with lived experience of a mental health condition who are employed at the RTC sharing our experiences and kind of help plan and implement the whole process of the State of the Science Conference. So first I want to go over kind of the, the overall voice of what young adults were saying through the panel, through these papers, and just kind of during discussions throughout the conference on systems and policies and the needs for research and change in this area. And Nancy brought up a great question of where young adults are and what is the role of young adults in planning and evaluating service and policies. And I think that's a huge point is that just bringing young adults to the table this conversation and figuring that out is essential. Um, young adults themselves, although not everyone is agreeing and we saw some of this at the conference on the adult side, they recognize themselves and myself as a unique population with unique system needs. So two young adults and a young adults bringing up in this conversation that no, we aren't the same as adults. Although, although the adult system may think that we need to be served the same way and have the same needs, um, young adults have identified themselves as a separate population with separate needs that the system and these policies need to recognize that. Um, young adults also recognize that we really need support staff who are knowledgeable about both child and adult systems. We had a specific young adult on the panel who brought her case manager and said that she was essential to have in this whole, as she navigated the system, that as she was traveling between these child and adult systems, she couldn't have done so so smoothly without her case manager who really was able to know about both sides and help her navigate the way. Um, and that's, that's hard for a lot of young adults, I think, is aging out and transferring systems and needing someone there who's able to manage both and really knows the difference in what, what's going to be expected. 
Also, um, the young adults and some of the family talked about how the services and policies need to enjoy, um, address all areas of young adult life, not just mental health management. So we're talking a lot about the mental health needs of young adults, but these young adults are saying, you can't address um, mental health without first addressing our needs of housing, our needs of employment, the fact that we don't even have the transportation to receive these services and to engage in these systems. Um, and that we have, we need jobs, we need to be talking about relationships. So for young adults specifically, all these things are going on at the exact same time and they really need these to be addressed directly at the same time in order to really feel that their mental health is being addressed. Now for education pieces, a lot of things we heard at the conference um, for young adults on the secondary education level were different uh, difficulties with balancing work and school life. Uh, young adults talked about how during school, it's different for young adults than adults and for children because they're also learning to balance um, working full time or part time and attending college or high school and just kind of figuring out that balance and how to do so. And they, they didn't feel like they could accurately do that and needed to find out what, what they could be doing for there. Um, also, for transition plannings, we, someone brought up earlier today this idea of tr the transition plan for an IEP. And young adults voice their concerns with transition plan and more, more research needing to be done on transition planning because they didn't feel it was up to par. They felt like they were alone in these transition plans, that some people didn't even know what a transition plan was who had been on IEPs, and that they weren't accessing these services and weren't receiving these transition plans that were a big part of the conversation for um, secondary ed. On a post-secondary education level, we had some panelists and myself and other young adults at the RTC talk about their personal experience with um, college and their supports at a college level and the research being done there and where it needs to go. And they talked a lot about stigma preventing help seeking on campus and just that the stigma of a mental health condition, as much as it's changing and getting better with time, it's still so high that people don't feel like they're accessing services or their ability to access services even there. And there needs to be more knowledge about what stigma is and how it's affecting um, these young adults. Uh, there needs to be more self-advocacy or peer opportunities and peer support opportunities. We've had some great conversations at this conference so far about peer support and how imperative it is. But these young adults just kept coming back to where's the research showing that peer support is effective? Where's the research on campuses about these self-advocacy groups um, like Active Minds or NAMI on campus, which Marsha brought up earlier, that do exist? Where's the research backing this up? Do we know how they're helping and how we can be helping more? Um, they also felt like there was no continuity of supports and services across universities. Um, I had a negative experience when I first started school with asking for supports and them just not knowing what to do with me because I was diagnosed with a mental health condition and kind of just telling me to take a break and come back when I was ready. And we had other um, young adults on the panel and during these discussions talk about their negative experiences with universities and how they ended up transferring to another school and had a wonderful experience. So they're really recognizing how some universities knew what to do really well, and on the other end, there were these other universities who didn't really seem like they had it together yet with mental health, and we needed to figure out what was working and what wasn't, and how do we make everyone be on the same page with those positive experiences. We had a great quote in one of our um, papers for the State of Science Conference, which you can see in the little blue square, so I won't read it to you directly, um, but it was just talking about that balance of work and school life and how um, really navigating your mental health at the same time of trying to figure out stigma and services and what opportunities are out there was really difficult and can be really time consuming and difficult, especially at this period of life. Um, on the employment level, um, an important factor of employment that all the young adults address, and I feel like we hear all the time, is this piece of employment is essential to recovery. That in order for young adults to feel like they were on a path to recovery, they needed to have this sense of employment and learning about themselves as an employee and as a person in a career field. Um, we also talked about, which was touched on a bit, is this diversity of the definition of career path. Um, we had a lot of family members at the conference also talking about that. Um, how to some of us a career path meant going from high school to college to a, a job and kind of growing in your career path that way. Where to other people it meant going straight from high school into a job, um, say at Dunkin' Donuts, and then moving up in Dunkin' Donuts to sustaining employment and staying there for a while and moving up to become a manager and take on different roles and responsibilities. Uh, so the young adults really voiced that 
for young adults specifically, this diversity in what the definition is um, needed to be addressed and the researchers and people out there needed to be asking what does a career mean to young adults specifically. Also in employment, um, providing age-tailored employment services was so important. We often talk about these evidence-based services that are out there for employment, but we don't necessarily know much about the young adult population and how these um, services are tailored to them. And we don't know if it's effective and what's really working. And young adults are recognizing that they knew they needed different things, so it needed to be addressed in these services that we're providing. And just kind of this idea that we found really interesting and um, I feel like a lot of the young adults definitely related to, which was in a lot of these services, it's looked at as temporary employment and jumping from job to job was a bad thing, but during the young adult um, time period of life, job exploration and kind of exploring what a career means and jumping from jobs to learn about yourself was an essential positive piece of kind of development and learning what the young adults what we as young adults needed and what we wanted to do, that you can't just assume that a young adult going into a program already knows their career goals and is able to, to provide career goals to you without kind of trying out different jobs and trying out different fields and really learning about themselves that way. Um, also finding employment, a young adult in our panel directly addressed finding employment with a criminal record to be really difficult and just the fact that trying to move forward after dealing with the juvenile justice system um, could be really difficult in this path of creating a career for yourself. And just kind of the fear of disclosing your mental health condition in the workplace or to your employer was a really difficult issue that people needed, wanted to see more being addressed on that and the repercussions. Um, there was another quote that I just wanted to leave you with that was great about employment was um, letting uh, someone talking about being let go simply because they disclosed their mental health condition and not because they were symptomatic or their symptoms were affecting their job. That employers still need to be educated on what it means to have a mental health condition while um, in a job and just kind of what that looks like and training young adults on how to advocate for their needs in a way that's appropriate and it's gonna help them and not hinder them in their career. So that's my piece on Youth Voice. And I'm going to turn it over to Steve, who will give you a, a first-hand example of how we're doing all these things in one of our states. Thank you. Yeah, I have the unenviable task of having to follow up such great presenters, so uh, it's really an honor to be here and to really present uh, this presentation from the perspective and context of an administrator of adult systems. So I'm going to talk a little bit about historically in terms of where we were in Maryland, in terms of how we got to where we are now. And I think a particular model of system change that I borrow from uh, our colleagues at the University of Maryland, the punctuated equilibrium model, which I think shows that uh, Maryland has really uh, gone through change through some extended periods of evolution marked by these small, discrete periods of revolutionary change or transformative change. I think I'm going to try to show a couple examples on some incremental change that have led to where we are today, and then one key example of some transformative change uh, that is responsible for some of our, our system change efforts that we have experienced in Maryland. So in initially from the inception, uh, our state legislature established a statewide interagency transition plan and a comprehensive strategy for addressing the needs of this population. It initially focused on developmental disabilities, but because of some strong advocacy from youth, family members, and other stakeholders in the community, uh, and the identification of needs with mental health as an underserved population that required more attention, uh, there actually was additional focus on this particular population. Through this advocacy, the Governor's Interagency Transition Council was established by executive order of the governor and this mandated representation of the major statewide adult and youth serving agencies that address the needs of transition age youth. In that mental hygiene administration, the state mental health authority, as well as key mental health stakeholders and advocates, including the youth and family organizations were mandated partners of this organization. Um, this particular entity, again, through a series of incremental changes by bringing together all of these partners and stakeholders, was able over time to elevate the profile and needs of this particular unique population and really served as a catalyst for change. In particular, it mandated participation of all of the agencies and eventually it became monitored by the Department of Disability. So what used to be a governor's interagency group under the auspices of an office 
on disabilities, then later on became elevated to a cabinet level secretariat position. So each agency had accountability for reporting on their goals to a cabinet level secretary um, in terms of what their accomplishments were in meeting the needs of the transition age youth. Particular areas that were focused on were cross training for stakeholders across each of the various state agencies, resource mapping, which looked at a comprehensive systematic approach to identifying the needs across systems of this population, and then an interagency website um, that really required a, a pooled funding strategy so each agency had to contribute money and resources and staff in-kind contributions in order to make that uh, a functional uh, operation. And again, as I mentioned, there are mandatory state strategic and operational plans with a single point of accountability to what became um, the governor's uh, Office of Disabilities or Department of Disabilities. So why should the adult system focus on this age group? Well, the biggest reason is that uh, longitudinal evidence suggests that a disproportionate percentage of children and adolescents do reach adulthood. <laughs> so that's the biggest reason. <laughs> so these are gonna be in our system. If they're not in our system, they're gonna affect our system because they're gonna cost our system money and they're gonna cost money of the systems that we interact with. So it's a, it definitely a need for the state to be able to focus on this population. And in our system, it's the single largest growing age segment of the population served by the public mental health system. When I went back and reviewed the data over the last five years, it's actually growing at a rate of 25% per year in terms of the number of youth served. And the last data that we have shows that 21% of adults served between 18 and 25 are in the, or 21% of adults served in the public mental health system are between age 18 and 25. So it, that really mirrors what the representation of the population is in, in the general population at large. So uh, another reason I think for adult systems to pay attention to this population is that we really have experience in the adult system in addressing the needs and desired outcomes that youth and young adults have identified as priorities. In particular, uh, youth come to our systems and say they want employment, they want jobs, they want help with post-secondary education, and they want help with housing. Adult service systems have experience in providing services and supports that facilitate employment, post-secondary education, and housing. And then finally, um, although this is preliminary data, we have some emergent data from our system that shows there's some potentially potential cost savings uh, of providing targeted developmentally appropriate services and supports to this population at younger ages and it may actually provide cost savings in the long term in terms of reduction of costly uh, inpatient or hospitalizations. Okay, I'm gonna go over this really quickly. We have some experience providing transition age youth initiatives from 2000 to the present. There are specific, uh, TAE specific, again, these are developmentally appropriate services that are targeted to this population. In 12 of our local mental health authorities, there are currently 24 are those programs statewide? And this is based on a recent Joint Council uh, report that we did for the legislature where we surveyed all of the core service agencies to identify the programs. These are funded by a combination of fee-for-service and state general fund dollars. Um, each of those were initially developed and conceptualized based on a competitive review of proposals in 2000. We've been able to sustain those ever since. Uh, we're now relying more and more on federal fee participation and Medicaid, and, but we've actually maintained through some very tough financial times the amount of money that's been devoted toward that population. And again, there currently there are 24 programs statewide. And over time, we've actually been able to refine those programs based on, can you go back, please? Thank you. Refine those programs based on what we've learned from the experiences of providing them in those jurisdictions. Um, and we're currently in the process of aligning all of those programs with um, the transition to independence process approach um, that Rusty Clark and his colleagues have developed. Wanted to focus a little bit on early psychosis, first episode psychosis. Um, this is one way for the child and adolescent systems to really engage adult systems partners. There's a lot of focus in the adult system around uh, developing programs and services for first episode psychosis. Many of these programs start early. In fact, our program in Maryland begins at age 12 up to age 30. So the theory is that if you begin early enough, you can identify the prodromal signs and symptoms 
of early psychosis at age 12 and begin to implement developmentally appropriate research-based strategies at that age to really change the trajectory of somebody's illness and in many cases hopefully prevent the onset of disability. So this is really exciting, cutting edge research. Um, there's gonna be a set aside in the state block grant of 5% for programs and services devoted and targeted toward this population. So if you're not already working with your adult system partners on first episode psychosis, I would urge you to do so. Oops. Okay, and again, the, um, the transition age youth initiatives, they were a variety of different scope, focus, age range, interventions, and modalities. And so we learned how to provide those services, and now our goal is to be able to bring those to scale statewide and replicate the approaches that we've learned and make sure that they're well aligned with an empirically supported strategies and supports. Okay, so what were some of the strategies that we used in Maryland to be able to bring this to scale and to be able to focus on this? Well, first of all, we leveraged existing resources. We funded those elements that were funded through the public mental health system, through the existing fee-for-service system, and then we used other funding, such as state general fund support and funding from other agencies to fund those services that were not otherwise available in the public mental health system. We expanded for those programs, those TAE specific programs, the youth and young adult specific programs. We expanded the diagnostic eligibility so that people could enter those programs as children and adolescent, cross the age divide, and continue to receive those services and supports into adulthood up to age 25. We granted access to supported employment, and you've heard how important supported employment and employment in general is to this population at age 16 so that youth and students in school systems at age 16 could access the supported employment prior to graduation from high school because one of the key indicators of post-school success is actually early work experience. Um, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail about our supported employment systems transformation, but this was one of the transformative changes we had in, in Maryland. So, is really quickly, anybody who's eligible for supported employment, for the, anybody who's eligible for public mental health system benefits, eligible for supported employment, automatically eligible for VR services. VR presumes them eligible at the most significant level of disability. There's a deemed status approval. So any provider that provides our service for supported employment is deemed eligible to provide VR, so there's no separate provider. It's seamless and transparent to consumers. And the VR system has guest access into our system. So there's one application, one door of entry. A consumer comes to us and said, I want a job. They talk to the provider, provider meets with them. There's one intake. That provider enters the information into the electronic care management system, automatically sent to their doors counselor. Doors counselor, based on that information, with the consumer's consent, access to all of the consumer's prior treatment and rehabilitation records, can immediately deem them eligible for VR services immediately proceed to plan and begin starting on job development and placement. So within two weeks at maximum, but usually with the click of a mouse, somebody is immediately eligible for services and begin working on, um, on developing a job consistent with their interests. Um, some real important uh, considerations we've learned, uh, approximately a two years duration seems to be the average for people in these taste specific services. 70% of individuals 16 to 25 who are enrolled in our taste specific programs have engaged in employment compared to 46 in other parts of the system. Uh, again, I am gonna emphasize uh, it's real important to develop supports which are designed specifically for this population rather than trying to retrofit services in the child and adolescent system to meet the needs of this population or conversely retrofit services in the adult system to meet the needs of this population importance of leveraging, blending and braiding and pooling of resources across multiple systems, ensuring that your workforce has core competencies in developmentally appropriate and empirically supported practices for this population, and again, training and consultation to your workforce that includes not just practice improvement, but focus on organizational change because your organizations, your provider agencies need to implement policies and practices that support or facilitate the ability of your practitioners to meet the needs of this population. So that's really quick, uh, but thank you so much, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to present the perspective of an adult systems administrator to this group of all but one child and adolescent uh, <laughs> folks. So thanks again.